session will be recorded. All right, let's get started. Um, so welcome everyone to the unemployment insurance information session for nonprofit and municipal employers. Um, we are here today to talk about unemployment insurance. Uh, specifically, what do nonprofit and municipal employers need to know? Whether you're already enrolled in unemployment insurance or if you need to register for the first time, you're in the right place, it's great. Um, and so we're gonna go over your options and liabilities as a nonprofit or municipal employer. Um, we'll also share some guidance to help you evaluate your options and go over how to register or change from one option to the other. Um, and before I move into introductions, I just wanna give a quick disclaimer that Vermont Department of Labor is not gonna be able to provide business advice. So we do have a wonderful panel here to support in that area, but we do recommend that you consult a financial consultant um, for specific questions. Um, Lisa, can you please advance the slide? Thank you. So today, um, let's start with some introductions. My name is Emma Paradise. I'm the Senior Policy um, and Strategic Initiatives Manager here at United Way of Northwest Vermont um, and Common Good Vermont. And co-presenting today with me is Cameron Wood. There he is, <laughs> UI and Wages Division Director for the Vermont Department of Labor. We're also joined by a few panelists. Uh, on the screen, we're joined by Lorianne Aubin from the Vermont Department of Labor, UC Tax Auditor. And to my right is Dave Dorr, co-founder of Structural Integrity. And his business partner, Sage Ruth, is on the line um, as well. And they are financial consultants here to support uh, during the Q&A session. We are also joined by Lisa Greffe, who is my coworker here at Common Good Vermont, Manager of Learning and Education. And she will be providing tech support throughout the day. And in the room with us is Rowan Hawthorne, Principal Assistant at Vermont Department of Labor for any Interesting piece. Sorry, the camera's not moving, but to my right. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass things over to Cameron um, to provide an introduction. Sure. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Thanks so much. Um, Lisa. Yeah, Lisa, if you want to go maybe to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so so real quick logistics. Um, this is a hybrid webinar. We have some individuals online, also individuals here in person. So I will do my best to speak to the camera, but also uh, to everybody here in the room, acknowledging them as well. Uh, it is recorded. This will be available on the Department of Labor's website, uh, as well as uh, Common Goods uh, website. Afterwards, we will make the slides available to, to those here who are uh, participating, and we also have some additional materials that we'll be providing out uh, that we've been developing to to further inform the discussion that we're having today. So, anything I missed? Um, I think just lastly, we'll hold all the questions for the end. Virtual participants, uh, we have the Q and A function. We invite you to use that and vote up other questions. Folks, ask if you have that question as well. In person, folks, um, Rowan's going to help us keep queue, so just let her know if you'd like. And ask a question and we'll get yeah. um, and Lisa is on the call if you have any virtual uh, support needs all right let's get started Lisa if you want to go to the next slide so um, again Cameron Wood I'm the unemployment insurance director for the Vermont Department of Labor so I oversee help oversee the unemployment insurance division um, many may know that all liable employers are required to register with the Department of Labor. They're required to report their quarterly earnings to their employees, quarterly wages to their employees, to the department every quarter. Uh, before I jump into the detail, I just want to make a few comments. First off, I just want to give a special thanks to Emma, her team, Common Good Vermont for all the support they've been providing the Department of Labor with this law change, uh, helping to develop these informational materials, co-hosting this event, 
Uh, so I really just want to thank them and, and give a shout out to Emma and, and the hard work that she's been doing over the past few months and in, in helping us pull all this together. So um, the, the second thing I wanted to mention was there is a lot of information that we're going to go over in this very short amount of time. Uh, as I mentioned, the slides will be available, but there's a lot of detailed information here and a lot of detailed information that we'll be walking through. Uh, please know that the Department of Labor is here to support, um, especially the small nonprofits where there is this legislative change. They will now be required to, to cover their employees. And I imagine that that's uh, going to be a big lift for a lot of small employers here in the state of Vermont. And so we are here to support uh, as best that we can. Uh, and this is just the initial engagement of trying to get the information out and, and get the information to the proper people and answer questions that they may have. But I'm just wanting to acknowledge a lot of information here. We're trying to uh, provide it in the best user-friendly format that we can, but we know there's going to be a lot of questions uh, and a lot of um, gray area to, to work through. So I want to start with um, this. This all kind of stems from a legislative change that was made earlier this year during the past legislative session where the Vermont General Assembly expanded unemployment insurance coverage to include nonprofits with less than four employees. So prior to this law becoming effective, nonprofits with four or more employees were required to be registered with the department, were required to report quarterly, and were required to cover their employees for unemployment insurance. The change that is going into effect on July 1 in 2024 will now require all nonprofits, irregardless of size, to register with the department and provide coverage to their employees. So the the push the information push and the outreach that we're doing is to try to make sure all of these small entities are aware of this change and are then prepared come july 2024 and aware of what their options are because the the other key piece that emma mentioned at the beginning nonprofit and municipal employers actually have options when it comes to how they finance their unemployment insurance obligations and that's what we're going to also talk about throughout this presentation and throughout the slides that we have. So uh, the presentation is really for all nonprofits, but please know that we'll be talking about this legislative change that goes into effect in July of 2024 for these small entities. So uh, the, the key piece right here on the slide, it's effective July, 21, July 1, 2024. What does that mean? That means for these small entities beginning in July of 2024, they will be required to report their wages paid to their employees to the department on a quarterly basis. And as you can see here on bullet point one, that means July through September, that is the third quarter of the calendar year, and that report is due October 31st, 2024. So for these small entities, that is the first report that you will be providing to the department where you will have to list out each of your employees and report their wages to the department moving forward on a quarterly basis. A few other key pieces of information to also be aware of. Uh, these entities will now be required to report their new hires to the department within 10 days of onboarding those individuals. So anytime that you onboard a new staff person, you have to report that information to the department within 10 days. And I also want to identify that there is information on the department's website that walks you through how to do both of those things, how to do your quarterly reporting and also how to do your reporting for your new hire employees. So if you're concerned about, okay, how do I actually go through the steps of doing those things? There is information available on our website uh, that's, that you can look and, and work through. And we're also happy to answer questions uh, that, that come to us. So the key piece here is you're covering your employees for unemployment insurance benefits. Um, prior to this legislative change, if an individual works for a small nonprofit, they are not covered for unemployment insurance coverage. So if they are laid off, they would not be eligible to use those wages uh, to, to make themselves eligible to receive unemployment benefits. 
So with this change, that means that these small nonprofits will have to participate in the system uh, and, and cover their UI employees in the event that they're laid off. So Lisa, if you wanna to go to the next slide. So there are two options that nonprofits and municipal entities have. And this is unique because this is not the case if you're a private employer. If you're a private employer, you are required to be taxable and you are required to pay your UI quarterly contributions. You do not have options. For nonprofits, regardless of size, both small and large, and for municipal entities, they have options here. They can be either taxable, which is the default option, and that's where you would pay quarterly taxes on the wages that you pay your employees, or you have the option of being a reimbursable employer. And what does that mean? That means that you're still reporting your wages to the department on a quarterly basis, but you're not having to pay taxes on those wages. Instead, what you would do is you have to reimburse the state, reimburse the Department of Labor dollar for dollar for any benefits that are paid out due to you having to lay someone off or a separation from employment. So these are the two options that we're gonna discuss throughout this presentation. And this is where it's gonna be a lot of information about which option may be best for you. Uh, and, and as Emma mentioned, and I'll just kind of reiterate once, uh, the department cannot choose an option for you. That is up to you as a business entity to figure out which option works best for you. But we are here to try to provide information and guidance that will be helpful as you work through that decision. Uh, one thing, just lastly, before we move on, I just want to make sure is clear irregardless of which option you're looking to choose, taxable or reimbursable, you have to report your quarterly wages to the department. That is an obligation, irregardless of which option uh, you choose moving forward. So, uh, Lisa, next slide. Uh, before we uh, keep going and, and deep dive here, I just wanted to get a few definitions out of the way and, and make sure we're kind of communicating uh, and, and using, uh, giving a definition to terms that I'll be using throughout this presentation. What is an employee? Uh, for purposes of this presentation and for purposes of the guide that we're pulling together to provide, uh, an employee is an individual who performs services to an employer unless that individual is exempt under the law. So, as an employer, you need to think about it very broadly because the, the statutory definition is very broad. If you are paying wages or remuneration to an individual who is providing services to your organization, that individual is an employee unless they are specifically exempt. There is a list of exemptions on the department's website. So under those tools that are available, there is a specific form, it's a two page form, and it will literally walk through and give you every instance where somebody is an exempt. So for example, elected officials are exempt. So if you're a municipal employer on the line, elected officials, you do not report their wages to the department because that's exempt employment. For the definition of an employer, again, just trying for purposes of the conversation to, to be as inclusive as possible, is any individual or type of organization that employs one or more individuals performing services in the state of Vermont. There are certain employers, again, that are exempt under the law, but for purposes of this presentation, if you are a registered nonprofit entity, you meet the definition of an employer by nature of the fact that you are registered as a nonprofit at this point. Similarly, if you work for the state government or a municipal employer, by definition, you are an employer. So um, a few other quick ones, just reimbursable and taxable. Again, this is wanting to make sure everyone understands when we say reimbursable, we mean that that's an entity that's chosen to reimburse the trust fund. If you're taxable, that's an entity that's chosen to pay quarterly contributions. And then the last definition that we're going to use in this presentation is what's called a base period. 
And that's going to be important if you choose to be a reimbursable employer. Uh, why do employers report their wages to the Department of Labor? It's because we use that information to make someone eligible for unemployment insurance benefits. Individuals who file for unemployment, their weekly benefit amount is determined by a calculation looking at their wage history that's been reported to the department. And so that wage history is used to both calculate their weekly benefit amount, but it's also used to determine how we charge employers for their unemployment insurance obligations. So what you need to be thinking of as an employer is the base period goes back 18 months. So I tell employers this all the time, somebody voluntarily separates from employment or you lay someone off, they could file up to 18 months later potentially and use wages that you've paid to them in their base period to establish their claim for benefits. That's important because if you are a reimbursable employer, that means 12 months after you've laid someone off, if they become eligible for unemployment, you are potentially paying for those charges. And so just trying to get employers to understand that just because somebody separates, you need to be aware of the potential impacts to your business well after the fact. Lisa, next slide. Okay, so here's where we're gonna start to get into the weeds of, of what these options mean. So taxable is the default option. This is all private employers are taxable, as I mentioned earlier. And if you register with the Department of Labor, the default that you are given is to be a taxable employer. And that means that you are paying a payroll tax on the wages that you pay to your employees. And to, to be very clear for, for the small employers that may not be aware, you cannot pass that tax on to your employees. It is not a shared payroll tax where some you know, employees pay a portion and employers pay another portion. It is a strictly employer payroll tax. So uh, what do you need to know? Uh, again, they're due quarterly. And what do you need to know about that wage report? The, the three things you need to understand are you need to understand the gross wages that you're paying to your employees because those are reported to the department. You need to be aware of the taxable wage base and you need to be aware of your individual employer tax rate. And we're gonna get into a little bit more detail about how those things are calculated in a few slides. But for purposes of this discussion, know that the taxable wage base for calendar year 2024 will be $14,300. That taxable wage base is adjusted annually, so it can decrease or increase. Uh, but what it means is you'll be paying your tax rate on the $14,300 you pay to each of your employees and that is done on a quarterly basis. Those are the key things that I think you need to understand as a taxable employer. Um, how do we set your tax rate? We have to set the tax rate based on the individual experience of each employer. And this is a rolling three year average. So for employers that have been registered with the department, uh, you should be fully aware every year you get a tax rate notice, which tells you what your tax rate is going to be for the following fiscal year. We calculate that tax rate by looking at the prior three calendar years. And it's a ratio that we use looking at how much in taxable payroll have you paid out to your employees and how much in benefit charges have been attributed to your account. There's a formula that uses those two pieces of information. It gives you a benefit ratio and that benefit ratio is used to establish what your tax rate is. The current tax rates range from 0.04% to 5.4%. So understand that you could fall anywhere within that range depending on how many individuals you've potentially laid off over the past three years. For small employers that are going to be registering for the first time, 
you need to be aware that you're new, you get a new employer rate, which is 1%, and you're given that new employer rate until there's been a full calendar year of registration. So what that means is if you're registering for the first time in January, or excuse me, July of 2024, you're gonna get a 1% rate and you're gonna keep that 1% rate until July of 2026, okay? And I'll walk through that a little more detail here in a little bit and we'll talk, you know, I'll remind everyone again why that's important. Again, key things to take away here, employer payroll tax, you need to know your gross wages, you need to know the taxable wage base, and you need to know your tax rate. And using those three pieces of information, you can calculate how much you're gonna owe in taxes each year. Uh, I am going to turn it over to Emma, who's going to talk a little bit about kind of the pros and cons of what the taxable option could mean for you as, a, as an employer. So Lisa, next slide, and I'll kick it over to Emma. Thanks, Cameron. Um, so yes, with either option, of course, there are trade-offs. Uh, also, it's really dependent on your organization's specific situation. Uh, so for example, the taxable option could potentially be advantageous for small employers with fewer wages paid, you have a lower annual cost, um, your tax base is lower. Uh, it's also could be easier to budget for. You know what your tax rate is, you can calculate that year over year. It's easier, it's also less risky. It's easier to find, you know, that $1,000 on an annual basis than that $50,000 once in a blue moon. Um, if you, for example, had a reimbursable benefit claim. Um, it's also, eligible for non-charging benefits in certain situations. Cameron's gonna go through those in just a minute, but as a reimbursable employer, there is no circumstances under which benefit charges could be um, relieved. Uh, and then the tax rate does fluctuate based on the tax schedule, uh, which is determined by the health of the UI fund. So one year your taxes might be lower, you might have the same situation, no benefits paid, but the UI fund isn't looking so good, so it moves from a schedule one to schedule three, increasing your tax rate. Um, and then you could also have to understand that you have an annual expense, even in years with no claims. So if you have really low turnover, you could consistently be paying the same amount, uh, even whereas if you were a reimbursable employer, you wouldn't have any, um, you wouldn't have to pay anything. Um, and then lastly, you, do need to do a little bit more work in your reporting, calculating excess wages and taxable wages for your quarterly reports. Um, those are just some considerations, but again, really just things to weigh and based in your own personal situation. Um, uh, next slide, please, Lisa. So, so one thing here we wanna talk about on this slide is something that Emma mentioned just a second ago. If you are a taxable employer, you can be relieved of charges against your experience rating under certain circumstances and they're listed here. I'm not gonna read them each individually. I think the, the ones you need to be aware of are if someone voluntarily separates from employment, you're a taxable employer, this is the option you've chosen and somebody quits their job. If they go to file benefits, either immediately after that separation or at any point in the future, you will be relieved of those charges and they will not be attributed to your employer account. Uh, same thing if uh, you have to discharge somebody for misconduct associated with their work. If that is the case, then you as the employer will be relieved of any of the charges should that individual become eligible for unemployment at a later date. Some other key pieces here at the bottom. Uh, if you are a small nonprofit and you're only employing people part-time, those individuals may have another job that they're also working. And if they get separated from that other job, they may become eligible for unemployment. As long as you continue to maintain them for the part-time hours that you were offering them, you will not be charged any of those benefits. So these are key pieces of information to know if you want to be a taxable employer, you have the opportunity, or, or I shouldn't say have, it exists in the law that you will be relieved under these certain conditions. Do we ask questions now or later? We'll hold you hold them. The That's okay. Yeah. 
Um, another key piece, I think, is the second bullet here on the bottom. Uh, in the event someone needs to take uh, an extended leave uh, or family leave, and you bring on an additional employee to, to cover the, the individual while they're out on leave, and you bring the individual who's out on leave back, therefore you lay the person off who you, who you onboarded to help cover while they were out, you will be relieved of charges in that instance as well if you're a taxable employer. Um, Lisa, will you go to the next slide? The next slide we're gonna talk about reimbursables, but I wanna, I wanna keep on this, this um, thread for a second because as Emma mentioned, and as you can see here on the very bottom of this screen, if you're a reimbursable employer, you will not be relieved of charges in those situations I just identified. So if you're a small nonprofit and you're, let's use the part-time wage example, you're, you have people working for you part-time, they're laid off from their other job, same example that I gave a minute ago, and you're a reimbursable employer, you will pay proportionally for the wages that are in that individual's base period. When I gave the definition earlier of base period, that's where that comes into play here. So if you are, again, you're paying someone part-time, I got to emphasize this, you're paying someone part-time, you're a reimbursable employer, they get laid off from another job, you will be charged to the proportional wages in their base period. So you're not going to cover the whole claim. You're not going to have to cover every bit of benefits that are paid out. But let's say you're 50% of the wages in their base period, you're going to pay 50% of the charges for that individual in that situation. We saw this during the pandemic. Uh, this was extremely frustrating for a lot of nonprofit entities because what happened was someone voluntarily quit a nonprofit employer who was a reimbursable. And then 12 months later, the pandemic occurs and everybody gets, you know, all the businesses because of the emergency order, we ask non-essential businesses to close. So that individual gets laid off from a separate employer, has nothing to do with you as a nonprofit. They quit 12 months ago because your wages are the wages in the base period for that claimant. You are paying for those benefits, not the employer who separated the claimant. So that is what is key for the reimbursable option. I think there's a lot of uh, pros to being reimbursable. You, you don't have to pay taxes, um, but you need to be aware that you will not be relieved of charges in most instances. You will be required to pay for those claims dollar for dollar. And that's the key piece on this slide to be aware of. Uh, if you choose reimbursable option, you do not have to pay on a quarterly basis. You don't pay the quarterly taxes. You do have to report your wages quarterly to us, just like a taxable employer. You're just not paying those quarterly uh, UI contributions. Instead, you're going to pay us back dollar for dollar whenever benefits are paid out. Um, just so everyone is aware, we do provide monthly charge statements to all employers. So every employer, whether you're taxable or reimbursable, you will get a statement from the Department of Labor every month that identifies the charges that are being attributed to your employer account. So you'll be able to see social security number, how much are being charged, and you should be using that information to check your records to determine whether or not somebody separated, whether or not the wages are accurate, et cetera. So just wanna make sure everyone's aware as a reimbursable employer, you're gonna be aware of what your charges are when you look at those monthly charge statements. And then when the quarterly UI contribution report comes around, we're gonna send you a bill for the quarterly uh, benefits that have been paid out uh, during that past quarter. So it, it is you owe on a quarterly basis. Um, one small note in here, uh, as a reimbursable employer, you do have the option of paying us quarterly uh, in anticipation of charges. So if you think you, you usually lay someone off at a particular time in the year, say it's come winter time, you have to lay someone off for a few weeks, uh, you can pay us throughout the year in order to account for those charges at a later date. And then we would true that up at the end of each year and we can either reimburse you if you've paid too much or we can send you a bill at the end of the year 
uh, and you can you can owe it to us at that time. Um, I think that's all I have here. So next slide, Lisa. I'm gonna kick it back over to Emma. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, just to break down those what Cam just explained and some of the pros and cons around the reimbursable option. Um, so it could potentially be advantageous for employers with stable employment. Um, you know, you're not laying a lot of folks off. Um, you know that year over year. But again, as Cam was mentioning, there is that case where several leaves voluntarily and you're still on the hook for that claim. So it's not without risk. Um, and larger employers may also find it advantageous. Um, not only might, will they have higher taxes um, with more employees, but also um, they may have stronger reserves and be able to handle an occasional uh, benefit charge. Um, of course, there's no cost incurred unless a benefit claim is filed. So that's um, a strong argument for the reimbursable option. Um, it's, you just have those quarterly reporting requirements, none of the extra work. Um, there, it could be more difficult to estimate costs um, with the potential for unexpectedly large bills. Um, you really can't predict the future, especially you know in today's economy. So um, really making sure that you are prepared to handle um, claims that may come. Uh, and as I mentioned, again, you will be liable for all benefit charges that cannot be attributed to another employer um, and cannot be relieved of charges for any reason. So just some things to consider um, surrounding the reimbursable option. Um, all right, Lisa, next slide. Okay, um, so we've tried to talk about the two options here, taxable, reimbursable. We've tried to give a little bit of a high level understanding of what those mean, quarterly contributions versus dollar for dollar reimbursement. As we mentioned earlier, we, we don't provide business advice, so I can't tell you which option to go with, but what we can do and what we're gonna try to do over these next few slides is identify or, or give you information on how you can go about trying to determine which option is gonna be best for you. And Emma's gonna provide uh, like a case study here in a little bit to kind of describe different scenarios that may, uh, as you're thinking through your organization, may uh, get you to lean one way or the other, depending on what your anticipated future circumstances are. And if I may just real quick, Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, just we will have all of this in more detail in the guide that we'll share with folks afterwards. So just know this isn't your only chance to break this all just down. See this, yeah. yeah, just to help, yeah. Uh, again, I know there's a lot of information available on this slide, so uh, it is, we are going to give it to you, so you will have the opportunity to read it in more detail, and Emma mentioned the guide that we'll send out, which will have even more information. At the end of the day, what I, what I mentioned earlier with the taxable employer, you need to know what is your gross wages, what's the taxable wage base, what's your tax rate, and how you can go about then trying to determine how much you're going to owe. You're, you're going to pay your tax rate on the taxable wage base. And in 2024, it's the first 14300 paid to each employee during the calendar year. So what does that mean? You're reporting to us on a quarterly basis. Let's say you pay someone $10,000 in the first quarter. What, what's your tax rate? We talked about how you calculate that looking at a three-year average, looking back at the, the past three years and coming up with that benefit ratio which then gives you your tax rate. For argument's sake, let's say it's 5.4%. You've had a lot of layoffs over the past few years. You have a lot of turnover. And so you've gone all the way to the highest tax rate, 5.4%. You're gonna pay 5.4% on that first $10,000 you paid that employee in the first quarter, but you haven't met the taxable wage base yet, which is 14.3. So when the second quarter rolls around, you've paid that individual another $10,000 in wages. You're gonna pay that 5.4% on the 4,300 to get you to the taxable wage base. At that point, you're not paying contributions anymore. And I'm using that as an example to let employers know that if you choose the taxable option, you're primarily gonna be paying most of your taxes in the first and second quarter. Because that's when, if you have employees at least year round, that's when you're meeting the taxable wage base. So that's when we see most of the UI contributions coming into the trust fund. However, let's say you hire somebody in August. You pay them $7,000 in the third quarter. You're going to pay whatever your tax rate is on that $7,000 again until you meet the taxable wage base, at which point you would no longer be paying contributions at that point in time. 
So what you can do is knowing that information, you know, knowing what the gross wages are and when you're going to pay them to your employees, you can calculate which quarter you're going to owe uh, how much, and, and you can kind of multiply that out. And, and again, it's described in a little more detail on the screen. Um, again, I want to emphasize the, the last piece of information on the bottom right here, key day, July 2026. If you are an employer and you're registering for the first time, you're going to be given a new employer rate because we don't have that history. We don't have those three years to look back. And so you're going to get the new employer rate until you've had a full calendar year for us to calculate. And because of the way this is going to work for these small entities that will register halfway through the year, we're not gonna get a full calendar year until all the way through 2025. And so you will not get an experience rating until July of 2026. So if you're, if you're listening to the presentation, you're a small employer, I'm gonna be liable in July of next year, what is my best option? you can know that between July of 2024 and July of 2026, your new employer rate is going to be 1%. And then from there, you can try to calculate out whether or not you've had to lay individuals off uh, during that period of time. So, uh, Lisa, next slide. Uh, so real quick on the reimbursable side, uh, as we mentioned, you will pay back dollar for dollar uh, of benefits paid out. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. Um, but how do you know how much is going to be paid out? Uh, this slide is really intended to give you information on how an individual's weekly benefit amount will be calculated. Uh, the way the formula works is, remember the definition of base period, so looking back at their history of wages, we take their two highest wage quarters, we add them together, and we divide by 45, and that's how we get their weekly benefit amount. The maximum weekly benefit amount is currently $705. So the maximum you're going to potentially pay is $705 for a weekly benefit amount. Uh, the, the key pieces of information that you may not have, though, again, the scenario I was using earlier, you only hire someone part-time. You don't know what their other wages are that could be used from a different employer to help calculate their weekly benefit amount. So that's a piece of information you may not have if you choose to be a reimbursable employer. But at the end of the day, uh, on this screen, it shows you how you can try to estimate the weekly benefit amount. If you're paying someone's salary, you could take their sal you know, you could take their annual salary, divide it by two, and then divide it by 45, because that's going to get their weekly benefit amount up to 705. Keep in mind that people are eligible for up to 26 weeks of benefits. So you would then need to take that weekly benefit amount, multiply it out by 26 weeks, and that's how much you could pay if you are a reimbursable employer. So again, just ba you know, based on that limited information that you may have, you can try to calculate out if I anticipate I'm gonna need to lay somebody off next year, here's what their wage history is, Here's how much their weekly benefit amount may be. Here's how much is the maximum that I may pay up to 26 weeks. Uh, also a key piece of information to keep in mind, if you are a reimbursable employer and we get into a period of high unemployment, the federal government allows for us to extend weeks beyond 26 weeks. And you could be on the hook for paying some of those charges as well. So just understand if it's a period of high unemployment, it may not be capped at 26 weeks. Fortunately, uh, the federal government in both the recession and the pandemic came in and covered those costs. So they were not passed on to the reimbursable employer, but that is not a guarantee to occur in, in the future. So, um, okay, uh, I think Emma's going to walk through a few different kind of case studies to give some examples of uh, some scenarios to, to help you uh, hopefully maybe lean in, in one way or the other. Um, go ahead. Emma. Thanks, Gail. Yeah, so, and again, I'm going to walk us through this, um, not in a lot of detail. This is really just to give a sort of a basic understanding of how a claim could impact one specific employer with a very specific situation. Um, and so just bear that in mind that this is not catch-all example, just one example um, to help understand the process. So 
Theoretically, it's 2023 and you are a small nonprofit organization that used to be exempt from providing unemployment insurance, but now you have four employees and you know that all nonprofits, regardless of size, will have to register by July 1. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're choosing the right option um, and that you're ready um, to cover your liabilities, especially in these uncertain economic times. So in this situation, um, we break it down. You have four folks on your staff um, making you know, everywhere from 14,000 as a part-time admin staff to 70K as an executive director. And you wanna know for this first piece, how much would you pay as a taxable in your employer in your first year? And also what would your potential liability be as a reimbursable employer? Um, so Lisa, if you'll move to the next slide, um, we'll break that down for you. So in your first year at the 1% new employer rate, uh, your annual cost for the staff would be 569. So pretty small, if you're a small organization, not a huge cost. Um, but then looking over at the reimbursable side, you could see you could potentially be liable for $49,000. Of course, it's highly unlikely that all of your staff will leave in one year, but you know, you're still need to be aware of that and know that you may have to come up with that amount of money, um, which as a small organization could be very challenging. Um, and so the amounts listed next to the executive the different staff members is the about that you would have to pay for each of them, maximum amount assuming um, full benefits paid. So worst case scenario, but that's just sort of to give you a sense, compare and contrast. Um, so then on the next slide, Lisa, um, now we wanna think about what happens if you do have a benefit claim made against you. Um, so in this scenario, we suppose that the part-time administrative staff member left, um, putting you on the hook for $10,000 <laughs> um, worth of charges. And so make it through the first year, no claims. 2024, you have a claim, still at that 1% tax rate. But then looking forward, that one claim for a part-time employee has bumped up your tax rate to 5.9%. And then in 2026, 5.3%. And then for the third year, because again, they stay around for the last three years you're looking at. Um, so you'll be at 5.3% again. And again, this case study is explained in the guide that we'll share afterwards in much more depth, but really just want to you know, paint a picture of what the potential impact could be um, on in this specific example. Um, so what was the long-term impact, um, Lisa? Please flip to the next slide. Uh, so breaking it down again. Um, so over the years, with those increases in taxes, as a taxable employer, you would have paid eleven thousand dollars five hundred and sixty-seven, um, which compared to the reimbursable for that maximum benefit amount of ten thousand nine seventy-two is actually more in the same period of time. Um, however, you know you were able to plan for those um, taxable years um, and it might have caught you by surprise that first reimbursable charge. So again, a trade-off. Um, but really the point I wanna drive home here is that with a taxable option, like car insurance, the more you use it, the more you pay. So you just really wanna be cognizant of that. Um, and also just um, meaning that employers with more benefit charges are taxed at a higher rate. Um, and that will stay with you for three years. Uh, on the other hand, reimbursable employer paid less in this case over the same period of time. It could have gone the other way, you never know. Um, but you also want to know that the employer, if they decided to switch taxes after that claim, they would still be liable for those charges while they were a reimbursable employer. So then they would be liable for that claim and have to pay annual taxes going forward. So it doesn't disappear if you just switch over. Um, and again, this case study is explained in much more detail of the guide, um, but just one example for a small organization of the impact of one claim. Um, so I think, Lisa, we can move on to the next slide. Back to you. <laughs> 
Yeah, so uh, we, we pulled together just a few FAQs and a few other pieces of information based on some of the initial comments that we received back from the public and some initial questions that the department has received, that Common Good had received in anticipation of this uh, information session. So uh, one, of the, one of the questions I've received is going back to the definition of an employee, what about contractors? If I have independent contractors and I'm a small nonprofit, Am I required to cover them? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, if they are a true independent contractor, meaning they meet the state's so-called ABC test. And there is information on the ABC test on our website. We're going to have information in the guide that lays out specifically the requirements of that test. If there are uh, questions about it, I mean, I'm happy to kind of quickly walk through it if that would be helpful. But at the end of the day, if you do have contractors, you will not be required to report them, but keep in mind the state has a pretty expansive definition of an employee and it is your burden, it's the employer's burden to demonstrate that the person meets every part of that test to truly be an independent contractor. Another key thing I just wanna highlight for employers out there, especially those that are not familiar with the system and may be registering for the first time. The state of Vermont's employee test is different than the federal IRS employee test. And it is also different than even some of our other state departments within the state of Vermont. So you really need to hone in on the unemployment insurance definition and ensure that that person meets this test if you're going to consider them an independent contractor and give them a 1099 at the end of the year. But if you do give them a 1099, they would not be reported as an employee for unemployment insurance purposes. Uh, a few others that, that we received. Um, so, you know, I know that uh, Vermont Leagues of Cities and Towns operates their own unemployment insurance trust for uh, local governments. Um, I, I became aware through this process that there are other trusts that are operated for nonprofit entities as well. So we just wanted to, to be clear that if you're already participating in one of those two, uh, the, the change in law shouldn't have any impact on you whatsoever. We hope the presentation has been useful in giving you information on your options that maybe you weren't aware of. I can be reimbursable. Uh, or taxable, but at the end of the day, the, the legislative change that went into effect only impacts the small nonprofits that were not required to be registered prior to next July. Uh, a few other questions that we had received, what about religious entities? Um, there is a specific exemption uh, in the definition of employment for individuals who are um, the uh, employee of a church or convention or association of churches. Uh, or an organization which is operated primarily for religious purposes, uh, there is still an exemption there. I also mentioned one of the other key ones earlier, elected officials, those individuals are exempt, um, but that's one of the other kind of key questions uh, that we've received uh, throughout this as well. Um, Lisa, next slide. I wanted to uh, also just highlight this. You know, we mentioned throughout this presentation the requirement to report quarterly wages. Okay, well, when do I do that? And so we wanted to make sure this information was available on the slides, highlighting the actual days that each of the reports are due. So the report is due 30 days after the end of the calendar quarter. So here, obviously, that is uh, straightforward. Uh, if that ends on a weekend or a holiday, then the due date would move to the next business day. One thing to keep in mind also, we didn't really touch on it throughout the presentation, but as you're determining which option is the best for you, taxable or reimbursable, the Department of Labor is statutorily required to charge you interest in the event you do not pay either your quarterly contributions when they're due or the reimbursable bill when it is due. So that may be something to also keep in mind. Emma mentioned it. Maybe reimbursable is, is not an option you want to, to go with because you're worried if somebody gets laid off, you're going to have a large amount due at one time as opposed to trying to spread those contributions out throughout the calendar year. Uh, just, just know that um, we are required to charge interest. And also, please know that 
irregardless of the option, as I've mentioned throughout, you have the quarterly report that's due. We do have to charge penalties if that information is not provided. So just want to make sure that is clear for everyone so we don't get somebody in a situation they were not aware. Um, Lisa, next slide. I think we're going to do a few quick uh, just next steps to, to wrap up and then go into Q&A. Um, so again, uh, new employers required to register in the third quarter of 2024. You will have 30 days from the day you register to elect whether you want to be a reimbursable employer. As I mentioned at the beginning, the default is taxable. So if you do not choose to elect reimbursement status, you will be defaulted as a contributory employer. You have to file your quarterly wage and contribution reports. Again, first one's going to be due October 31st, 2024. And I just also want to highlight that, you know, that is still uh, the requirement to register in July. That is still roughly eight months out, a little less than eight months out. So we are going to continue to put out more information and we will have specific instructions on where and how to register. Uh, we will provide that to each nonprofit that's registered with the Secretary of State between now uh, and spring. So just know that more information about how to go through that process will be coming out. If you wanted to go try to register today, for example, the system's going to tell you you only have two employees, you're not liable because that's what the law is. Uh, so we're working to make those updates to our system, and we'll have information about that here coming out in the near future. In the meantime, if you have any specific questions, you can email them. There's the email address, labor.uiinformation at vermont.gov, and we're going to have some of our team uh, available to help try to answer those questions as they come up. So. Uh, next slide, Lisa. Last thing to keep in mind is you can change your election as a nonprofit or a municipal employer. So understand that you can elect taxable or reimbursable when you register, but you have the option of changing that. And this is giving you a little information about when that has to be filed. So within a uh, Prior to 30 days before the end of the calendar year, you have to file that with the Department of Labor if you want to change status. So you've been taxable, you realize I've got stable employment, I don't anticipate laying anyone off, so I'd rather not pay the quarterly contributions on an ongoing basis, I want to switch to reimbursable. You can do that, you just have to notify the department and also know that that election will remain in effect for two years after you make the change. So just understand that if you're going to, uh, you're going to elect to change your status, that will be in effect. Uh, and also a special note to understand if you're a reimbursable employer and you switch to a taxable status, you will still be on the hook dollar for dollar for those wages that are in the claimant's base period. Keep in mind what we talked about base period earlier. Even though you've switched to taxable, you may still get a bill if you lay someone off. The way that's, you give me a look, the, the reason that is there is you can't switch to tax, you can't lay everyone off, switch to taxable and not, not be on the hook and get a 1% rate. Uh, you're going to have to pay for those benefits that are based on the wages paid when you were a reimbursable employer. So just be aware of that. Um, Emma, back over here. All right, so lastly, just some resources, and we will share these slides and the recording with you out afterwards, so you'll have all this information um, along with the guide. Um, but you have the email, Cam pointed, Cameron pointed out, um, with the Department of Labor, um, myself here at Common Good Vermont, I can support nonprofits, our friends at Vermont League of City and Towns, uh, Kelly Avery is your go-to there. Um, we also have our structural integrity, um, financial consultants here with us today. They are happy to help you out as well. Um, and as the guide we've mentioned several times today um, will be sent out to you. And of course the um, employment information manual that's already live on the Department of Labor's website. Um, so with that, I think we can move on to questions and answers. Um, Lisa, maybe while you'll pinning up our panelists and digging through the virtual questions. If there's any in-person folks with questions, we can start there. Did you oh, still have one? You want to start in person? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, well, you answered the one about the cycle of going flip, uh, flip flopping or sure. going electing back and forth. Yes. So that was that was great. Um, the other question I have is these slides will be sent, okay? And then the other question um, I had is you were mentioning that there is an what was the average rakes? I noticed the rate went beyond the was, did it go beyond the it was the uh, and the um, example it was five point nine. So what is the what is the bell curve or the average rate currently mm -hmm. overall? And then for if you have something more um, in our sector, like not for profits, mm -hmm. what does that look like? Or is that hard because it's both here kind of intermingled in that? But give me as much as you. Sure, can. sure. So, so I can tell you the, the way the tax schedule works. Um, Emma mentioned earlier, there's five schedules. So uh, we're in the lowest schedule now. Uh, the schedules is going to depend on how healthy is the trust fund. If the trust fund takes a nosedive, then the tax rates go up for everybody. We uh, move up schedules. So what I mean by that is the highest tax rate you pay in the lowest schedule is 5.4%. It's never going to go higher than that. In the highest schedule, it goes up to 6.4%. So it can keep going up. Um, and so... What are we experiencing? What's Vermont employers in general experiencing? So, most employers uh, actually live at the lowest end because they don't have any claims charged against them. So most employers have the lowest tax rate, which right now is 0.04%. Um, the, the way it works after that is when we are calculating all of the employer's experience ratings, when we look at that three-year history and we balance the benefits paid out versus the taxable wages paid in, we then have to rank all of them among the remaining classes. So I can't give you an average, um, but I can see if our LMI shop has any information on nonprofits in particular about if they fall within one of those categories more so than others. I don't know that information off the top of my head, but, um, it's a, it is a very complicated exercise we go through every year because what we have to do is, again, if you have no charges, you live at the lowest end. But every other employer has to be ranked because when you look at the different uh, classes, uh, each class has to have an equal distribution of wages paid out. And so it becomes very complicated when you're trying to explain to an employer, it's not only what is your history, but it is what is your history as it ranks to every other employer across the state. So that when you said 0.04, mm -hmm. um, that's not even one, oh, sorry, it's three o'clock. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, but I had- it, It's less than 1%, yes. I, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. And that's where everybody's falling. Because that's where most employers yeah. fall because they don't have any charges. Okay. They don't have any layoffs. All right. Mm -hmm. And then the last question I have, Cameron, is mm -hmm. um, if, if uh, an employer mm -hmm. goes back and notices and goes to those uh, statements that you send mm -hmm. out and sheets that there are folks where uh, they shouldn't be because of those, mm -hmm. uh, what do you call it, exceptions. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't be, have been factored in Correct. our rate. What is the, um, what is the paperwork look like in the yep. abatement period? How far back can yep. you go? What's that in the record? Yep. Uh, great Recognition. question. Great question. Before I jump into that, uh, I want to clarify something I said a second ago. Uh, I said the, the highest tax rate on Schedule 5 was 6.4%. It's not. It's 8.4%. I apologize for that. I just want to correct because this will be live after this. And um, So the highest tax rate you would pay ever would be 8.4% at the highest schedule. So just clarify that. Um, Great question. When, when you register as an employer and you are beginning to provide us with the quarterly wage reports, anytime someone separates from employment and they're using wages in the base period that are attributed to your employer account, so we know that you may be charged, 
we send you a separation notice, whether you're the separating employer or not. So back to the example I gave earlier, let's say you're employing somebody part-time and they have another job and they've been separated from that other job. If you have wages in their base period, we're gonna send you a separation form as well because that gives you the opportunity to notice us. I never laid this person off. They're working part-time. I'm continuing to pay them part-time. And then that allows us to relieve you of charges. Uh, You can also, if you're a taxable employer and you get a separation notice, somebody quits six months ago, then they file a claim. Now you're getting a separation form. Why am I getting a separation form? Well, it's because you have wages in the base period and you may be charged for those benefits. And so you need to fill that form out and let us know this person voluntarily separated six months ago. You will be relieved of those charges. So I'm making that statement because I need to make sure employers are aware when you get mail from the department, don't ignore it. Um, Because if we don't get that information back, we don't know any different and you will be charged. So then let's say you've missed it for whatever reason, mail didn't come, got lost, whatever the scenario is. So now you get that monthly charge statement and you're looking at it, you know, Cameron Woods on there, He, he quit. Why am I getting this? you have the opportunity to send that back to us and let us know. And then we can address it at that point in time. So what if many years have gone by or a year has gone by or a quarter has gone by is what's the time limit on that, that last, cause that that's Mm -hmm. the last piece, that little sheet, that, that statement. So So keep in mind that, um, and great, great question the charges that you're getting on a monthly basis, they will not impact your tax rate until the next fiscal year. So we only set the taxes once a year in July. So you get your tax rate for this fiscal year. And then in November, you're getting a charge statement. It's not going to impact your tax rate until the next July. So we can fix it between now and then. Got it. Um, Lori, I'm gonna I'm gonna phone a friend here real quick. Um, so there's no abatement because then those are uh, really like that's what I'm trying to say. Like, mm-hmm. what if that calculation includes some erroneous facts about the status of those folks, those part timers, or mm-hmm. those so on and so forth mm-hmm. that we weren't Johnny on the spot with mm-hmm. our documentation for one reason or another? Yeah. Right. So it's we, COVID. The paper got lost. The dog yeah. ate it. Who yeah. knows what? Flood. The flood took it in the mail. Right. Yeah. Montpelier. Yeah. Uh, what do you call? All so, of that. so again, we, What's our opportunity? so you will, back? you will get it on every monthly charge statement. So we will be able to address it all the way up until it affects your tax rate till the next year. But even after that, that's where I'm going to, uh, phone, uh, Lori Aubin is, um, one of our field auditors been with the department for many years. Lori, do you remember off the top of your head how there is, there is a point in time where we will not go back and take it off because we can't. And Lori, I don't remember if you if you know that off the top of your head. I do not know that off the top of the head. Um, but there, there's a lot of different circumstances that that weigh into the question that's being asked. Yep. So um, I will make sure we add that into the FAQ. Um, Very cool. We can, especially if there is good cause, we can ultimately remove it. Uh, I'm wanting to say if it's beyond a year, we will not. But I will clarify that. Let's jump to some questions. Lisa, what we got? All right. I will ask a few questions that I hope are short question, uh, short answer questions here. Um, The first question that we got in was the slide says all nonprofits need to register. What about nonprofits that have no employees? Uh, Great question. I've received this question as well. Um, If the If the entity truly has no employees, then they do not need to register with the Department of Labor. Depending on the circumstances, uh, and I'm I'm sure there are many out there that could exist for a nonprofit to not have any employees. So, so, you know, please, please understand. Uh, The point I'm trying to make is I've received the question of, well, we're a nonprofit, but we only have contractors. And I want to caution those employers, because again, 
the ABC test is very, um, it sets a pretty high bar to define when someone is a contractor and not an employee. And when the department is going in and maybe doing an audit, one of the things we're gonna ask is, how are you operating your business without employees? And so um, if, to hopefully give the short answer, if the nonprofit truly has no employees, they do not need to register with us. And I'm sure there are scenarios that could exist that that's the case. If you have only contractors, I would caution you to make sure you're reviewing the ABC test and making sure that those individuals truly are independent contractors. And in that case, if you only have contractors, you would not need to register with us either. Thank you. Um, I think a question that kind of relates to that is, how does this impact organizations hiring seasonal or temporary employees or interns? Great question. You, the, the entity will need to register and will still need to provide quarterly reports and they will just need to report those seasonal employees as they come on throughout the year and as they are working. So you could have a nonprofit, for example, that maybe doesn't have any employees for a specific period of the year, but then brings on seasonal employees during another period, in which case they would need to register. Even if you aren't paying wages, you are still required to submit a zero report. So please understand that. Let's say you have, uh, you only have people that work during November and December. You have to submit a report for the first, second, third quarter indicating that you've paid zero in wages. And then when you onboard those seasonal employees for those few months at the end of the year, you would then report their wages with the fourth quarter report at that point. Thank you. Um, we also had two questions come through about switching options and churches, which I think we already answered um, during the presentation. So I'll skip those two. The next question is, if we are an employer who employs in multiple states and we choose the taxable option, what happens if our Vermont employee leaves and we no longer have employees in Vermont? Do we receive a refund for the unemployment taxes we have paid? Yeah, the quick answer to that would be no. Um, we, you are paying your UI contributions based on the wages that were paid at that period of time. And we would not reimburse those simply because you are no longer an employer at a future date. So it's contributions based on wages paid during that quarterly period, and, and we would not refund those at that point. The only instance in which we would uh, refund contributions paid are when we determined that they should not have been paid to the Department of Labor, either because maybe it's exempt employment, you were reporting the elected official, and then we find out you shouldn't have, we can refund those. Uh, or if we find out that, uh, the, the wages should not have been reported to us anyway. If, if, if you're a nonprofit and for example, you have individuals working in multiple states and we find out the individuals should not have been reported to the Vermont Department of Labor, maybe they should have been reported to another state, we can refund those. But if the individual is working in the state of Vermont, you're going to have to file the quarterly reports to us and we would collect the contributions based on the wages paid during that quarter. Uh, Lori, did I, anything I missed there? Uh, no, the one caveat that I think is really important that everybody knows when the question was asked earlier about reporting, uh, you only report wages to individuals working in the state of Vermont. So if we go back mm -hmm. to the question about no employees, you know, we want to look at that as well. So you, especially now more, more and more people are working remote. So those individuals that are not working for Vermont would not be reported to Vermont and no, no refunds would be given. If you look at it as um, Emma stated earlier in the presentation about car insurance, it's kind of like you, you're paying for your car insurance. You don't have an accident, accident you cancel your policy. Thank you. You're welcome. Next yeah, question. Sorry, Sorry Lisa, ahead. just one quick caveat I'll mention, and folks may know this. I know we are talking specifically about employees in the state of Vermont, but just to give 
Vermont employers a heads up that if you are employing folks out of state, there could be other unemployment mm -hmm. laws you need to navigate within the state your employees are residing and working in. So mm -hmm. it does get a bit complicated for, for those who have employees in multiple states, because as we're learning today, unemployment insurance can be complicated and each state does have its own nuances. So just encourage folks to make sure they understand not only what applies to their state, their employees in Vermont, but also what might apply to their employees working remotely in other states for a mm -hmm. Vermont employer. Good but, point. Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Um, where do we find the list of exempt employees and how do we report wages for people that are determined to not be exempt but are not on our payroll? So if you are navigating on the Department of Labor's homepage, um, you can click unemployment insurance. I believe it's there on the, the left hand bar of the website. You click on unemployment insurance. Um, there should be information available for UI claimants and there should be information available for employers. Uh, under that list of information available to employers, uh, there should be a document there uh, that identifies what is exempt employment. Uh, it is a two page document and it walks through the different scenarios in which uh, we would consider the employment to be exempt from reporting. Um, Lisa, can you, can you remind me of the second half of that question? Absolutely. Um, the second half is how do we report wages for people that are determined to not be exempt but are not on our payroll? So, again, on our website, there is information available to, to walk you through the steps of how you would actually go about doing your report, filling out your report, and submitting that to us. And there are tools when you're reporting, it will help you if you're inputting the information correctly, it will help you, you know, determine what's the taxable wages, what are excess wages, what is owed. Um, I, don't, I may not fully understand the question, so if the individual who asked is still with us and, and they want to clarify, they, they can. Um, you, you do not need to report wages if it's exempt employment or if the individual is not working for you. I guess I'm misunderstanding the question a little bit. I feel like it was saying, uh, how do I need to report wages for people who are not on my payroll? If you aren't paying any wages during a quarter, but you're still liable, you still have to report a zero report. So you, you still need to file a zero report. Again, going back to the scenario I gave earlier where you may have individuals that only work during specific periods of the year, you still have to file that zero report during periods in which you're, you're not paying wages. Uh, but you, you do not need to ever report if it's exempt employment or if you have no employees, as I mentioned earlier. Lori, anything you wanna add there? I guess that what the way that I'm interpreting the question is for those individuals that aren't on payroll and being paid as subcontractors. I'm thinking that might be where the question's going. So that gets a little bit messy there. If you have an outside payroll company reporting in payroll, then you would need to file a supplemental report for those individuals that are not on payroll. And you can do that in many cases, you can work with your payroll company, they can add them to the original quarterly report and or you can do it manually yourself. If you as an employer, you are using our online version of the VitWiz system, you can just key your employees and the independent contractors that are not passing the ABC test and filing as one report. I hope that, is that helpful? Yeah, it's helpful to me, Lori. Lisa, one thing I will just put out there is if we're not, um, if we're not answering the question uh, or we're not understanding the question, and I see a comment saying that is helpful, uh, it looks like it may be coming from Jackie. Jackie, you know, you can use that email inbox, email us directly. We'll have somebody reach out to you and, and give you some, some further guidance. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, we are a summer camp. We hire quite a few people for nine weeks in the summer. Do we have to pay UI on those employees? If they are employees, yes. Uh, you have to report the wages to the department. And again, that's where you as an employer need to figure out what is the best option for you. Um, if you are seasonal and you are laying individuals off every year, reimbursable may not be the option you wanna go with because if they end up collecting, um, and we run into this all the time. There is no age threshold. You know, and I'm not sure if that question came in. 
Uh, it's not like, you know, this is my nephew and they're working for the summer camp uh, and they're 14. If they're in a, if, if your nonprofit is in existence to maintain that summer camp, that's what you do. And they're providing services to you. The age doesn't matter, uh, et cetera. Um, and so the point I'm driving towards is that may be where you want to evaluate what are your best options. Um, irregardless of whether the person files for unemployment or not, you would have to report them as an employee and report their wages to us in the quarters in which they are providing services. So Cameron, if someone goes into an employment relationship knowing it's a seasonal employment opportunity and it's a summer camp, I think it's a great example. It's a three month job mm -hmm. and summer ends, job ends there is still an opportunity for that individual to be eligible for unemployment? Correct, yes, great question and, and great, great chance for me to help clarify that, yes. Um, it does not matter if the employment is seasonal and it does not matter if the individual employee is aware that it's seasonal when they take that job. If you lay them off, they are potentially eligible for unemployment benefits if it is a separation that was not their cause. It's not misconduct, et cetera. They didn't voluntarily quit. The balance there is the individual has to be able and available and actively seeking work, right? So um, summer, high school kid working a seasonal job, they're going back to school, seasonal jobs over, you lay them off they may not be able to collect because we're gonna look at it and say, okay, well, you've gone back to school, you're not able and available to seek work. So that situation, the person may not be eligible for unemployment, but I think to the question, uh, for unemployment insurance purposes, it does not matter that it is a seasonal employment and that the individual employee is aware of that going into it. The only time that impacts unemployment is actually for school teachers, people who work for the educational system. Uh, if the individual works for an educational institution and has a reasonable assurance of going back after uh, an annual break, they cannot use those wages to establish a claim. Any other seasonal employment would be treated as a layoff and potentially eligible. That's helpful, yeah. thank you. Uh, Lisa, I think we got a question in the room. Yeah. Emma, if you're okay. yeah. So if you enter the employment agreement with the employee saying this position starts June 1st and goes through August 31st, that's still considered a layoff as of August 31st, even though the agreement was that it was only for those months? If they are an employee and we have to look at it and determine who is the cause of the separation. So if you as an employer are saying, I have a job for you, but it ends on August 31st, Absent other factors, we would look at that and say, you employer are the one severing that employer relationship. And therefore the person could use, could use those wages to make themselves eligible. So there's a, there's a lot of factors that go into eligibility. So for example, an individual has to be attached to the labor market. So that's where the wages and the base period comes in. We're getting into the weeds of claimant eligibility, but you have to have earned wages in multiple quarters. You have to have a minimum wage quarter, and then you have to have 40% of that within the other base period quarters. So if you're employing someone for two months and that's their only job, they're not gonna be eligible for unemployment because they don't meet the labor, they don't meet the wage criteria. So, but to answer your question directly, if it is an employee and, and you as the employer are identifying the period in which the employment relationship will exist, it doesn't matter if it's a week, it doesn't matter if it's two months, we would consider that a, a layoff from employment, absent other factors. Yeah. Questions about what others go. Sure. <laughs> Do we have any more in the room? Yeah, we have a few here. Okay. Um, you may have answered this question already, but I'd just like to list of anybody. Uh, does a reimbursable employer contribute to unemployment benefits for part-time employees who is uh, still employed at the nonprofit? Yes, yes. So um, the, the question for those online was, um, if you're a reimbursable employer and you have somebody working part-time, 
Um, are you on the hook for those charges even if they continue to work part-time? Yes, yes, and, and the answer would be yes. So, so again, as we talked earlier, that's the, one of the, the drawbacks of being a reimbursable employer is even if you're not the cause of the separation, you're going to pay proportional to the wages in the person's base period. And so uh, that is one of the risks of being reimbursable or what they call self-insured is you, you, you're on the hook for those. Against the best interests of the organization, is the employer still responsible for their share of benefits? If you discharge someone for misconduct or gross misconduct, if you're a taxable employer, you will be relieved of those charges irregardless of whether the person ends up becoming eligible at a future date. But if, you're if you're reimbursable, if it's gross misconduct, the person can't use those wages to make themselves eligible. So no, and I will confirm that. But if it's for misconduct, they may not be eligible in that moment, but if they become eligible later and you have base period wages, I believe you would still be on the hook for that, but I will confirm that and we'll put it in the FAQ of the guide that we have just to make sure that's clear. Yep. Uh, and, and I just, um, there are specific thresholds that rise to what, what meets the definition of misconduct and what meets the definition of gross misconduct. There is some information available on our website. Um, so I, I also just wanna make sure that's clear for employers who may not be used to participating in the system. Um, you know, you, you have to do things like documentation and, and other things uh, in order to be able to discharge somebody and then consider it to be misconduct or gross misconduct. And there is uh, information available on our website about how to, how to do that. Uh, last one. Nonprofits are registering next July first. How will the taxable wage base apply? So um, the taxable wage base, again, is set as a, in a calendar year. So for next year, calendar year 2024, it will be $14,300. Uh, the question was, if the small nonprofit has to register in July, how will the taxable wage base impact them? They will pay on the first 14300 they pay in wages to their individual employees beginning July. So even though they're becoming registered and it's becoming effective halfway through the year, that is when the taxable wage base would start for that employer who registers in July. And then the next year, whatever the taxable wage base would be, that would then pick up in January for the wages you're paying to your employee at that point. Lisa, back to you. Awesome. Um, I see that we have a lot of questions still come in. So just for everyone who submitted one, if we don't get to answer your question today here on the call, we will make sure that we either follow up with you um, or we will include all of the answers to your questions in the guide. Just want to make sure that everyone knows that we will be we will get the answers to you to all the questions that you submitted. And thank you for submitting those. Um, one question that I got that I would like to ask next is our municipality employs only elected officials. Do we still need to register slash file quarterly reports? If there are individuals who are working for that municipality that are not elected officials, then they would need to be registered and report for those, those individual people. Um, my best advice in that instance would be to reach out to Vermont leagues of cities and towns. Uh, they have, um, um, a lot of supports that they can provide information they can provide to municipalities as it relates to this specific issue. Um, so 
if it is an elected official and that's the only person that works for that town, then they would not, similar to the nonprofit that doesn't have any employees, they would not require, they would not be required to be registered. Thank you. The next question is, if churches are exempt from paying unemployment taxes, will we still need to register and report our monthly wages? No. All right. <laughs> um, can a nonprofit ask the department to rule on the ABC test for hired contractors? Lori, do you want to answer that or do you want me to? No, I'm happy to answer that question. Uh, I get calls daily from employers that want to run scenarios by me. So I always I always advise to the employer to err on the side of caution and uh, report unless they've spoken to somebody in the department and received clear information as to whether or not the individual should be reported. Because there's many, many factors that go into the ABC test and not one test is alike when you're applying it to an individual. So they and could the, call... And Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, Lisa, real quick. I mean, in the in the the issue that we run into is, you know, without having one of our staff like Lori on the ground able to gather all of the facts of a given scenario, it's hard for us to give you a definitive answer. Um, you know, we do our best and we try to say, you know. You know, given the information you've provided, it could be this. I agree with Lori. I think it's always about, you know, um, cautioning employers. Um, but again, we, you know, we can't be in a position where we're making those determinations unless we have all the facts. And when we go in and do those investigations, that includes gathering information from the employer and it includes contacting the individual employee or independent contractor and gathering information from them as well. So uh, it, when we don't have the full picture, we can't just, it's a very rare scenario where we can definitively say yes or no. It, and if I can add the facts that are given to us today and a decision is made may not be the facts next year. So all of a sudden somebody may not pass a prong of the test that are currently meeting it. So it, unfortunately it's just not black and white for every situation. Thank you. Um, the next question is, we have employees from overseas that are here on J-1 visas for the summer. Do we need to pay on that? That is one that I want to take back and, and make sure I get the, the accurate answer. Um, as, a, as a general rule, if the individual is authorized to work in the United States, then they are required to be reported to the Department of Labor. Uh, Lori, go ahead. Uh, J-1 visas are exempt in statute. Okay, okay. Piece of information, that's what I wanted to go check. Thank you. Um, the next question is, so if they are working 100% remotely and live in New Hampshire, but the business is solely based in Vermont, should I be paying unemployment to New Hampshire? Lori, you wanna jump in? Yes, so in that situation, the work is going to be localized to the state of New Hampshire. Therefore, that is where, again, as a 501c3, I don't know what the rules are. Every state has their own rules, but it would not be reported to Vermont because there's no work being performed here. So I would highly recommend you contact New Hampshire, ask what their rules are. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, there is another follow-up question on the summer camp. Um, in the exempt document reference previously, um, number 13, is some services per, um, performed by students for a summer camp? Does this mean this exemption is no longer valid? No. Uh, again, it's one where without, without all of the facts of the situation, I can't say, yes, that would be employment or yes, that would meet the exemption. Uh, what I would advise is for that employer or individual to reach out to us through that email inbox that we provided, and then we will have a staff member, you know, contact them and give them some more information based, based on that. Thank you. Um, next question is, if we're part of the VLFC trust, um, T trust, do we have to do the reporting you reviewed at the beginning of the webinar? 
Again, I would advise that employer to reach out to VLCT and, and communicate with them. I know there are certain things that VLCT does on behalf of their members who are part of the trust, so I will defer to them on, on providing that guidance. Perfect. Um, and Kelly just wrote in the chat, yes, they do. So thanks, Kelly, for, for adding that. Um, how about engaging volunteers that receive stipends to cover costs? Lori, I'm going to let you jump in on that one. Uh, stipends can be gray, so it depends on the reason for the stipend. An individual that is a true volunteer and not being paid, there's nothing reportable because, again, everything is about wages paid. Uh, the stipend, it depends on what the, what the stipend is for. In some cases, if it's a reimbursement, then obviously that would not be reported. If, if it's for a service, then we're going to need some additional information. Um, so just noting that it is the 3.30 hour, sure. um, and if panelists are able to stay on a little longer, we have just a few more questions in the chat, um, yeah. but if folks need to leave, certainly feel free. Um, Let's knock them out real quick. Okay. Um, so in the chat, um, one person asks, if we're starting to pay state taxes, do we need to start paying federal taxes? Um, and then... Yeah, let's start with that part of their question. Sure. Um, if so, if they're starting to pay state. Um, my understanding is uh, there is a specific exemption for uh, charitable organizations, 501c3s at the federal level. So even though you are now uh, going to be covered for state unemployment insurance purposes, uh, you are likely exempt at the federal level and would not be required to, to pay food and taxes. Uh, if, and I'm talking about strictly nonprofits, um, as far as local governments go, way outside of my lane, and I will have to defer them to someone else. Yeah, Cameron, I'll only add that my understanding is it's like specifically nonprofits under the 501c3 mm -hmm. statute mm -hmm. of the tax code. So if you have a different registration, you want to explore whether you, that exemption applies. Um, so the next one might be a specific situation, but for new hire reporting, if we haven't been doing that, should we report the current employees when we sign up? Um, Lori, do you know how we advise employers in that situation? Good question. I do not know. Yeah. Um, I don't. We'll, we'll, we'll do our best to remember to put something in the guide as it relates to that. I don't think, let's say when you register in July, I don't think you need to automatically report everyone to us as a new hire. We're going to get that information on the quarterly report when you submit it for the first time. But if A, you're not reporting new hires when they come on, we would ask, and, and you are registered, we would ask that you please start. Uh, but for these new employers that are liable beginning July of next year, uh, don't feel like you need to report everyone out of the gate, but if you do then onboard somebody after you become registered, we would ask that you report it at that time. Um, okay, next one. And I think we touched on this some with the in permanent employees, um, but this person asks that entities I work for tend to have a lot of non-standard employment situations, such as employing seasonal employees, interns, AmeriCorps. Um, can you speak to how these kinds of situations are handled in relation to unemployment? Um, are time-limited positions like this handled differently? Yep. Uh, as a general matter, they're not handled differently for our purposes. Uh, again, as we kind of talked about a little bit ago, even though it is, for example, a seasonal employment, um, absent any other specific facts or absent it falling in one of the uh, exempt buckets that we had, you know, have talked about, the, the duration of the employment for UI purposes does not matter. Uh, same thing with an intern, for example. If, if you have an intern who's working for you and you're paying them wages or some form of remuneration, uh, also keep in mind, if you're paying uh, things like you know, room and board or paying for other, you know, um, other arrangements whereby you're paying remuneration, you're giving them something in return for their service that is reported as a wage. And so if it's an intern who's not being paid, then that would obviously not need to be uh, reported to us. Um, Lori, anything you want to add? 
there is an exemption in the law for interns. Uh, again, like everything else, there's there's um, there's pieces to it that need to, without going too deep into it, an intern may possibly be exempt. So that's all in the employer manual as well. So, or something that you can contact the department and ask specifically about interns. But yes, yeah, Cam's also right in regards to living. So we have to assign a wage to that, even if there is no pay. Great. All right, and then I think this is the last one, unless there's anything in the room. Um, if we want to stay with the taxable option, do we need to do anything? I'm guessing the answer is no. No. No, if you're already registered and you're already a taxable employer, there's nothing you need to do. And then, Lori, keep me honest here. Uh, if you were to register as an employer, default, we're gonna, you're going to be a taxable employer as a default option, and there's nothing else they would need to do at that point, correct? That's correct. can't register until July, June 2024? So, great question. Um, and the question was they, they can't register until July. If you're a small nonprofit, you can voluntarily elect to register and cover your employees sooner than July if, if you choose to just understand by doing so you are obligated to submit the reports obligated to pay so if you want to register early you can um what i would do is contact us through that email inbox or or on our website we we have the option of voluntarily registering small nonprofits. the the issue is right now if you went to our online portal to register and you enter that you're a nonprofit and I only have two employees, that's going to tell you you're not liable. So um, it is possible. Just understand that the, the reporting obligations flow uh, to when you want to register. So can I just add on that? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Lori. If you're interested in doing a volunteer election, the time is now. So it has to be completed by December 1st. So what you would want to do is do a registration. Somebody from the dep department should contact you. At that point, you would tell them you want to do a volunteer election as of 1-1. Okay. So Cameron, there's a question in the room, and I think just to clarify, it's effective July 1, but the first time you'll actually be filing would be by October 31st of 2024. Right. Right. Correct. So, and that's where, you know, we are working internally to provide more detailed information about, you know, Effective July 1, those employers are required to cover their individuals. Um, we obviously want to make sure we're able to get all of these entities registered timely and orderly. You know, if we have uh, thousands, <laughs> correct, and, and hopefully not all on July 1. I mean, if, if you know, if, if thousands of employers want to register on July 1, then that's that's difficult for us to manage, you know, with the staffing levels that we have. So we will be providing more information on that. Um, our biggest concern at this point is obviously getting the communication out to all of these entities, knowing that many of them are seasonal, small, may not have employees, may not be aware, et cetera. So we're going to try to ramp up our communication campaign over the next few months into the spring. Um, I think what we're hoping is the key piece is to get them registered in the third quarter because the first report is due October 31st. And that's another key piece of information. You know, even if a nonprofit comes in the door in December of next year and says, I didn't know, I wasn't aware, we're still going to have to go back retroactively and get them registered to July 1 because that's what the law requires and the individuals have a right to have those wages in the system. So we're doing our best to try to get the message out. We don't want to be punitive in any way, shape or form, knowing that there's a lot of small entities out here that uh, aren't going to be aware even by July. So our goal is just to try to get people registered as quickly as we can within that quarter. Uh, so, so if we register early, then we need to start paying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you elect the tax, if you elect to be taxable. Well, yeah. 
Yeah. If you elect to be taxable, yes, we would. You, your your taxable wage base would start earlier. Uh, but but if you were to, you know, to Lori's point, this is this is the level of detail that we're still trying to work out. I mean, in general matters, we would only allow voluntarily voluntary elections up until December. But we're trying to figure out whether or not it makes sense to be more flexible. Does it make sense to try to get some people registered early if they're interested? Because if you start reporting the wages in the second quarter and you want the taxable option, you're gonna owe them in the second quarter or you're gonna owe them in the third quarter. Unless, again, depending on the situation, if you only employ people in the first half of the year, then maybe you don't want to register until you're required to, and that saves you uh, a little bit of contribution. So that's where uh, you know each individual entity would need to make that decision of what's best for them. Wow, we did it. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you to our panelists and to our amazing support team. Um, we will follow up with uh, the guide and slides and recording um, maybe this week probably early next week, um, but please stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, feel free to reach out to myself or the Department of Labor with any questions. Um, and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you.